Hello and welcome to the West London Sport QPR podcast. I'm Dan Bennett. I'm joined as ever by West London Sports Ian McCullough and former QPR striker Kevin Gallen. And um, before we start, I just want to read out a notice from our first sponsor of the podcast, Global Medical Professionals. They're specialists within the healthcare recruitment sector with a combined total of more than 25 years' experience of placing a full range of healthcare professionals, both in the NHS and in the private sector. So if you want to find out a bit more about their services, visit global medical pro.com. Um, and if you're interested in sponsoring this co- uh, podcast uh, or advertising on this podcast, please email info at Western, westlondonsport.com. Whew, right. <laughs> um, on to the football. Uh, it's obviously a goalless draw with Stoke City on Saturday. Um, Mick Beal was pretty honest that, um, after the game and said that he told the players that he was bored at halftime. Uh, I think a lot of the people in the stadium were quite bored as well, Ian. Were you, uh, were you a bit bored at halftime with that one? Yes, it was a bit boring. I had uh, two seven-year-olds with me, one at their first ever game, and it wasn't a, a ringing endorsement to uh, to get back and back to watch that Loftus Road. But the second half was much, much better. Um, and you know, they, I think the football they played second half was you know pretty good, and you know, fair play to Stoke. They the goalkeeper played very well, and they were dangerous in the last ten minutes as well. And I think all told, it's probably a, a decent a decent point for both teams. Yeah, well, let's just hear what um, Mick Beal had to say. I'll touch on it. Let's just hear what he had to say in, uh, in full after the um, after the game. They're a powerful team, really powerful team. And they came and uh, with a good game plan, um, changed from what they had been doing, which, which was a little bit of a surprise, took us some time. I thought at half-time, I responded. I thought Alex did well first half, made the game difficult for us. I thought we responded second half with a change and a change of shape, and we really pushed we really pushed second half and uh, we couldn't find the goal and if we can't find it then then I'm I'm pleased with a clean sheet you know we've been we've been looking for them and this week obviously we've had two uh, I thought it was a game that neither team was 100% in control of it would take it would have been a glorious win if we'd have managed to get the goal and it'd been a devastating defeat and I suppose you're on, on that touchline the emotions are up and down overall four points this week and two clean sheets I'm pleased with um Naturally, you you know, as a home team, you'd like to grab two more. But I thought over the week that the the players gave me a lot, and I thought the fans showed their appreciation at the end for the effort. I think they could see that we had a really good go. But they're um, I wouldn't say they're our worst nightmare, but they're a big, strong, powerful team. And then it's whether our football is going to overcome you know some of uh, the more direct play from them, certainly on set plays. And I thought we defended them in the main very well. Kenneth's had the big chance, hasn't he, off of the set play? So. Uh, one of them days, but if you can't win, let's not get beat. What was it um, thinking about bringing Dykes on half time? Was it just to bring that physicality? I mean, it made a big difference, didn't it, when you come on there? Yeah, the, the, nothing, there was nothing wrong with the three lads in possession. I just felt out of possession. Uh, we wasn't doing what I wanted, and it was allowing uh, Stoke to go quite direct and pin our two full backs in. So we just thought we'd change it, and I thought it had quite a big impact on the game. I thought their tactics had a big impact first half, and I thought ours did second half. and. Um, uh, and overall, got no complaints really. Uh, you know, as the home team, of course, we want to win, but we we just didn't have that that last pass. I thought it was some excellent approach play, um, some fantastic play. And you think of some of the bits that Chris and Elias do and, and Tyler do, but it's it's uh, maybe a little bit over elaborate at times. But we we certainly weren't for the 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 want of trying. We had a right go second half, and we just couldn't find the goal. But. Stoke were always dangerous, good speed, good physicality, quite direct in their play. Alex has got them up and fighting for their lives after a slow start and, and I think they'll jump up the league as it goes on now. Were you happy with the impact Lyndon had when he came off the bench? And like, so was it not really a reflection on Andre Dezel? Just wanted to bring you something different? Right? No, I'm a bit, uh, listen, I'm disappointed for Andre. I had to make a call at half-time. Um, and listen, he won't thank me for it because it's never nice to come off at half time. But I think we had to shake things up. The game wasn't going how we wanted, and I wanted to. I was. I said to the players, I was bored first half. So if I'll be really honest, I said I was bored. I said everyone in the stadium was bored. That's not how we want to play. So any chance we take the handbrake off and we have a right go at this, and Lyndon, can you go and put yourself about? We'll pick up some ball. We'll. And we'll run harder and we'll, we'll, we'll ask more questions of Stoke. And I thought we did that second half. And the thing that was missing was the goal. We, it, we got in the right areas. We just couldn't score. It, it was frustrating equally as the Blackpool and Rotherham games where, again, we had that momentum and we couldn't find it. So, um, 
if you can't, then let's keep the clean sheet, take a point, move on. I think it takes us in the top six, which having been in the job three months this coming Tuesday, with all the staff uh, changes, players leaving, with all the injuries and everything, I think going into the first international break where we are, and being a tinge bit frustrated is a good thing because you know hopefully we come back from the international break in a strong place. We play Bristol, Sheffield United away, and Reading at home within seven days or six days of coming back. <clears throat> Bring it on because they're up there, and and I think we're in a stage where we want to face every team in this league head on. I think we, we've shown we can do that if we're at our best. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, you know second half was they they played well. And they probably should have got all three points. But saying that, um, like you said, Stoke had a really good sort of flurry of chances, didn't they, at the end, where arguably should have had a penalty. And Alex Neal certainly um, certainly thought so after. And then they had that really good chance through, I think it was Campbell, when the ball fell to him in the box and he sort of bent it just wide of the post. So, And I um, spoke to Sam Field as well after, and he said something quite, that I thought was quite interesting, that sort of last season they might have even lost that game. And, I, and that kind of got me thinking, you know, since I've been covering QPR, I think I've seen them lose that game a lot of times where they've played really well. I, I'm thinking um, like Bristol City last season where they play really well and probably should get all three and end up getting nothing, you know. it's um, So, you know, maybe a point's all right. But, I mean, Kev, you look at the um, start of the season as a whole. I mean, you mentioned obviously you were at um, Millwall last midweek as well. Obviously a good performance there and a good win. I mean, you know, a lot of the talk from Beal has been about improving and trying to get in the team where he wants it to be. But I think it's important we kind of say like, well, been very positive, hasn't it, so far? Going into the international break in the top six. I mean, certainly, I'm sure you'd have taken that going into the season with all the change in the summer. Oh, 100%. Um, that's, a, that's a good sort of start to the season. Like you said, going in, six in the league. Um, now got two weeks off and whatever little niggly injuries some players are carrying or players that are injured and coming back, they've got now an extra two weeks to get back in, uh, to get playing in the first team. Yeah, I'm sure... Everyone, every QPR fan would be really happy with um, the start to the season. And you can go back and sort of think, oh, we should have won this game and, and won that game. But I think it evens itself out in the end. As, um, you know, I think, was it the, the, your team, Blackpool? I mean, that's a game where you're thinking you score first, you win that game and quite comfortably. And you can yeah. go back and you can think back on, on a lot of the games and think, well, if we would have won that game, we'd be in the top three now, the top four. But start of the season, if someone said to me, going into the international break, sixth place, you'd take it all day long. Especially with a new change of manager who wants to impl implement his new mm -hmm. ideas. And, and uh, you know, I think, was it six new signings? Is it five or six? Yeah, seven, was it seven in the end? Seven, seven new signings who have to come in and sort of, you know, different environment for them. Uh, imp implement a new style of play that they might not be used to at their previous clubs. So going in at six, I think it's a, a very good start to the season. Yeah, no, 100%. It's certainly looking very positive. And yeah, I mean, you, you touched on there, Kev, but Beal even said after as well, and Sam Field said it as well, actually, the kind of feeling from coming from within the team seems to be that they're happy that they're in a good place, but there's also a little bit of frustration and disappointment that a couple of games or a few games have gone the way they went. Blackpool being one of them, obviously you mentioned there. I think Swansea as well, they were frustrated with because they just didn't perform at their best. And yeah, I mean, you look at it and you think maybe they could be even be a little bit higher up, but certainly that's a, a good thing. You know, they're not, you know, had they started badly under a new manager and it's always sort of gets the nerves going, doesn't it, under a new manager when you make a bad start. So the fact they've made the start they have done, I think is is crucial. And I think we touched on it, didn't we, before we, um, before the season started, I don't know if it was you, Ian, or maybe we both said it, but like how important a good start was um, under Beal, and certainly it's like taking the pressure off, hasn't it, B? And um, you know, around the club, it's you know, good vibes at the moment. Yeah, I think. I mean, there was a obviously bit of disappointment after what happened at the end of the last season, the way sort of the season fell apart, and you know, we we discussed it over and over again, and you know, reasons why, etc. But um, I mean, to start the season. Not an easy start of the season. You some tough games thrown in there. Plus, you got injuries to sort of key players at the start of the season, like Willock. You sign players that are now injured. You got guys like Luke Amos, who was very out of anyone to get any credit for the, the, the disastrous second half of last season. It was probably Amos. Mm. Become quite an important member of the team to you know lose him so early and just to kind of there was a lot of doom and gloom around the place. You know, a lot of frustration they didn't sign, sign the strike and everyone was calling out for. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, real kind of, you know, 
you, you, not disappointment is the wrong word, but you know, a lot of negativity and people just sort of, oh, this team, you know, we're going to get sucked into a, a League One battle and it, it, all this kind of stuff. And I think you look at it now and you go, the, the start's been positive. You know, they haven't come racing out the blocks and won sort of their first five, but they've um, picked up some good wins, you know, showed good character, really stole a point at Sunderland. You're not expecting to get anything out of that when you're 2 down with three minutes to go. Uh, they've lost some games they should have won. They've drawn some games they should have won. So it's been... But as I've always said, just hang in there. That's all you got to do to stay in this in this race for promotion. You just hang in there between sort of fourth and eighth, ninth, tenth. Just stay in there. You've got a chance, and just that's where they are at the moment. Championship, you can play two games, not win any, and find yourself at fifteenth. So, but I mean, psychologically, you get to ten games, the new manager, and you're in the top six. You, you, you take that, you know, all day really. Um, and although they've played well, you wouldn't say they've been outstanding in every facet of the game it's been sort of encouraging the way they started it but you, you as Bill has said it numerous times there, there's plenty more to come from this team and you feel that he's just sort of scratching the surface of with, with what he's got and uh you know I think that's you know quite encouraging really yeah definitely I mean that's the exciting thing isn't it certainly seems like they've like you said they've not hit the ceiling or anything yet and you wouldn't have expected them to but certainly seems like there's a lot more to come which is um which is really exciting especially when the injured players come back but I thought, um, obviously, as we're at the first international break, obviously, we've kind of looked back at the start of the season there. But I thought it might be good to kind of go through the team and give our thoughts on each kind of section. I mean, goalkeeper, I don't think we really need to do because I think that's nailed down. Senny Dieng is just solid, as he as he always has done um, since he got into the team at QPR. But I think the fullbacks as well, pretty safe. Um, you know, Ethan Laird has looked really good, hasn't he, since he's um, come in on loan from Manchester United. I was thinking as well, um, you know, Dallow's been playing for United, hasn't he, at right back this season. I think he's he's been quite good and done quite well, but I mean, you're kind of looking at it and think like, is he that far off being able to play for United? Or maybe not. I mean, he's probably better, certainly better going forward than wan is. Um, you know, I don't think he's probably that far off what wan, wan is as a player, to be honest. So I think that was a great bit of business getting him and um, Kenneth Powell really looks to have come into his own now as well after a sort of mixed start to the season. But um, Kev, I'll come to you on like central defence is quite an interesting one because um, obviously Balogun and Jimmy Dunn have been playing because of injuries to Jake Clark Salter and Rob Dickey. But those two, arguably, obviously he started the season when they were both fit with Dickey and Clark Salter as the back, uh, as the two central defenders. So these two that are playing at the moment, are, you know, possibly third and fourth choice. But I mean, if they lose their places again, do you think that's a bit harsh when, um, when Dickey and Clark Salter come back, which is expected to be pretty soon? Well, first first thing is that's a great competition where you've got four really solid centre-halves vying for two places. And there's always that rumour of going around, of like, you know, change the system and play three at the back because uh, you've got four really good centre-halves. But look, I'm always a great believer. If you're, if you're playing well in the team, you stay in the team. And I went to the Millwall game and I thought Balogun was, was very good, solid. He's got experience. He's played, you know, he's played for Glasgow Rangers in some big games, you, you know what I mean, with, with a lot of pressure. So he can handle handle the pressure of, of games like Millwall, where it's, a, you know, the blood and thunder at the start and then it all settles down a bit. And Jimmy Dunn, since he's come in for Clark Sword, has been solid as usual. We know what he's, he's all about. He's a solid defender, looks to be a good character. I haven't seen much of Clark Sword because he's been injured, but what he is, he's a left-sided, left-footed, left-sided centre-half which always gives you that extra bit of balance. And we know about Rob Dickey, solid, been been excellent since he's arrived at the club. So it's a difficult one. You know, the, what you would have to say is if Dickey does come back, it's like, do you put, are you going to put him back straight into the team? And the thinking about that maybe he doesn't deserve to be in the team because Balogun's done well, but you know, he's an asset, as in a team with money might come in and get him. And, mm an asset you can't be having him on the bench so yeah this is the thing isn't it? it's weighing up like we spoke about before and we, we spoke when um, Mark Birch and come on as well when he um, replaced you Kev when you were elsewhere but he's he's kind of said about this as well um you know we're talking about like balancing the kind of what the club wants against getting results and what the right thing for the team is and there's always there's probably in the manager's head there's always that sort of internal battle going on isn't there where you're kind of weighing up what's best for the club and what's best for the team in in the short term yeah, no, it is. It's, there's a lot of politics going on in football that behind the scenes, not a lot of people know about. But you know, if 
if Rob Dickey's sitting on the sidelines fit for the next, you know, few games because Balogun's playing really well and and, and the manager thinks... He's 34 and it's, you know... He's, he just thinks that you go and if he's playing and uh, Dickey comes back in the team, he'll be solid. So, but then they're thinking maybe at Christmas, there might be talk, there might have been talk in August that some clubs fancy him and a deal might have been done. I don't know. We just don't know what goes behind the scenes. And, and if Rob Dickey ain't playing, one, he'll be saying, hold on, if I ain't playing, I, I, I might, he might think I've got, I've got to leave to get first team football and the, and the club, mm. the, the board might think, well, he has to play because we're thinking of selling him to maybe improve the team elsewhere on the pitch. So it is, it's, it's a difficult one, but you'd have to say when Dickie's fit, you have to put him back in really. Because yeah. not, not only is he's a good player, but two, he's been solid for the last two or three seasons. And and number three, which probably is the most important part for the board and, and the club, he's an, uh, he's an asset that, you know, might be able to sell and um, get good money for. Yeah, I think I think we can class all um, of the three centre backs apart from Balogun um, as that kind of in that asset group, can't we? Because Jimmy Dunn is what 24, 23, something like that. He's quite young, isn't he? Jake Clark Salter, I think, is twenty four, and Rob Dickey is yeah twenty four, twenty five, maybe twenty five now. Not hundred percent sure. I'd have to check that. But they're all at that age where they could be potentially sold on for for quite big money. So, Ian, do you think like with that in mind? And we were kind of talking the other day, weren't we, um, about Balogun as well. And we, we kind of agreed. I, I think he's looked decent. I'm not saying by any means that he's looked bad. But I thought against um, Stoke, and I know we kind of mentioned as well, like that there was a couple of moments where a bit of high mouth, a bit like where he kind of went to clear the ball and sort of missed it a bit. And there was a, a sort of a couple of moments where he was a bit like a bit nervous. Not to say that he's been bad and there was nothing sort of bad come of it. But I, don't know, I just think that's worth bearing in mind. I think he's been good. Uh, I think he's been decent, but there, are, there were those couple of moments I think were was a bit nervous. Um, so yeah, what, what do you think about that? Um, well, regards to Balogun on, on on Saturday, um, I mean, I think there is a bit of mitigation there in the fact that that, that sun was really, really bright. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know, you got a team sort of launching long balls in the box. It's it's a little bit of a lottery, you know, trying to trying to spot it. So I'll give him a pass on that one. Um, I thought Millwall he looked very accomplished on, on his debut. Just regards to the, the four you have, I mean. You got to remember they they got three games in six days when they return after this. Yeah, that's the true. away games at Bristol City, at Sheffield United, and a Friday night game at, at Reading, and, and these things generally sort of work themselves out, don't they? That someone will pull something, or you might get a suspension. There's always going to be injuries, and, isn't there? And I, and I do think you kind of, you, you know, he has talked about the option of going to a free if he wants to, um, and also a little bit of horses for courses. You know, who you're up against, what sort of strikers you're playing against, and I mean, you need four centre backs really. I mean Clark Salt has not kicked the ball since the first game of the season. Um I believe Dickey was playing through a lot of injury towards the back end of last season before he actually was was ruled out and you know his form did dip a little bit and that might be a factor. So just having that option just to mix it up and you can have someone can be afforded to give an arrest and just someone you know can come in and do a job. Um but talking to one of our colleagues Julian Taylor who does some work for us so he's a he's a Glasgow Rangers fan and he was sort of saying that the reason Balagan was let go, there was a bit of kind of debate as to whether it was the right decision. Was he, his, he wasn't always available and sort of injuries and thirty four on that. So, you know, whether he can play three games in a week is yeah, I doubt it. Probably uh, not. Yeah. Uh, you know, so but you've got him there. He's you know a good, good pro, good addition. Didn't cost any money, so it just gives you options as, as to what you've got. So I think they're in quite a good place really with the with the centre backs. You know, and I mean they have had two clean sheets since he's been in the side, which. You know, you could argue it was down to him, but I don't think that you had Rob Dickey played in both of their games Saturday. I don't think that's you wouldn't say necessarily that they wouldn't have got those clean sheets either. So, um, but I think yeah, they're they're in a good they're in a good place certainly in that position. All right, so we'll move on to um to midfield then. I mean, it's it, it's quite an interesting one as well, isn't it, Kev? Because um he, he's we've seen quite a bit of rotation there as well. Obviously, Sam Field's been an ever present again. Stephanie Johansson um has played the majority of games and has looked, I think, a lot better than he got did towards the back end of last season. And then it's that kind of third of the midfield three, isn't it? Um, where we've kind of seen the most rotation. Obviously, Andre Dizel's played quite a lot of games. Um, Taylor Richards getting injured was a bit of a blow because I think he would have played quite a lot. Obviously, Luke Amos um, got injured as well. Um, he looks quite good when he has played. Where are you kind of on the midfield and the options he has available? I mean, it seems like Field and Johansson are going to be sort of the shoe-ins and then maybe that 
third spot is the one where we see the most rotation. And I think when we see that Taylor Richards come back, I think he might be someone that maybe gets an opportunity. Well, they've got a lot of options, haven't they, really? I mean, you've gone through field has been, since he's gone back into his, what I would say his best position, his rightful position, sitting in front of the back four, which he got very, he's very good at uh, because he seems to have the right discipline for that role. And that's a main, a main um, factor for that role is your discipline of not running off and just you're in there, you're protecting, he's got good height. So if they do do kick it long, he protects the centre halves as well. Um, but also he's, he's, he's decent on the ball and passes it well. Johansson has been a lot better this season. Uh, I thought he was excellent against Millwall. You know, there's one thing Johansson has got, he's got absolutely, you know, he's cool. Uh, he's got very good composure and, you know, usually finds the right pass at the right time when he has to do it. Um, and then we, the, Tim made, I don't, I'm not even going to attempt <laughs> to say his second name, but Tim uh, played against Millwall. And for the first half, I thought, didn't start great. I thought he was, was that one of his first ever professional games? He played a handful for Villa and he came okay. on against Swansea. Yeah. Well, he looked a little, and, and this is not to say, I don't think he's, I don't know, I think he's got potential to be a, a good player because of his size. He's, he's obviously got good touch and he's got good, um, you know, athleticism. But I thought he was just playing a little bit slow and it was a little bit quick for him. But he'll he'll be okay in the few in the future. And then, like you said, Taylor Richards, unlucky to get injured, but looks to have good legs. And Luke Amos, you know, he's been really unfortunate with injuries. But what Luke Amos does give you is legs and aggressive running and closing down. So they've got a lot of good options there. But you did say there, Dan, that you know, Field and and Johansson is the captain, are sort of maybe the the shoe ins. But I would say. Depends what game they play, uh, what team they're playing against, size of the pitch they're playing against. He might go for more legs one game and sort of take um, Johansson out. And it's always good to come on and settle things down as a substitute. He's got a lot of good options there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does. But again, there's three games in the week. So there will be a lot of, ro- I'd say, a bit, a bit of rotation in that um, midfield area for those three games. Yeah, I definitely think like midfield is an area where, I mean, we spoke about centre-backs a minute ago, but certainly an area where rotation is going to be more common, I think. And certainly, like, depending on what the challenge is um, and who they're playing against, we might see different midfields. Because I think, like, against Swansea, wasn't he? And he sort of, maybe not regretted, but is the wrong word, but maybe thought he sh- should have changed things a little bit, especially in the midfield. Because, um, you know, they play, obviously, that quite high-intensity football, don't they, where they like to press. And I think, Rotation in midfield is going to be quite important this year. And is it not really a case of having like a best midfield rather than just hmm. a midfield that's most suitable for games? But saying that, do you think, like I said, when Field and Johansson are both fully fit, are they, do they play every game, do you think? Do they um, I mean, we, we I agree with what Kev says about Johansson. I think he's a class player. We know that. Um, I mean, he's not getting any younger though. Was he 32? So Something again, like I think, that, yeah. I mean, for example, you're talking about... Uh, Bristol City's Ashton Gate's got a massive pitch. So, for example, you might not start Johansson in that game. You might go with Field and uh, Irubunum. Um, you've got Amos nice. coming back just to kind of, you know, you and, then you've got a, and then you've got a game against Sheffield United midweek. You know, is that a big pitch as well, Kev? I can't remember. It's that she's a they're all big, they're all big for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? And then you, then you can sort of mix and match and say, uh, I mean, the game at Sheffield United away last year, I know they got absolutely one apart in midfield up at Bramwell Lane it was really noticeable how so you know having legs and size in that area is really important and I think they, they're, they're really well covered there you've got you know the, the, the qualities that Kevin's mentioned with with field Irubuno you know against Millwall the two of them I thought did quite well he, I thought he grew into the game um, I mean that midfield was a real kind of it was hair and scare him for the first half particularly it was very hard to get a foot on the ball and actually play any football. It was very sort of, as you'd expect, playing the game at Millwall. Um, but I mean, I, I think they're, they're in a good place in midfield. I think they've got some, something that they've got somebody who can do it, do a bit of everything. Um, yeah. Dazelle's done okay when he's done this season. You know, he got hooked at half time. That's not to say he was terrible, but it just wasn't his game. You know, he had to make a change, put in the size of Dykes up front, did 
I thought mate, they looked better when Dykes went up. Um, but he's done okay this season to sell. So it's just a case of it's such a long season, isn't it? 46 games. You just need someone that can do everything. And you, you might get an injury again before Christmas and then you've got, you know, Richards coming back as well. So it's, I think they're, they're, they're well, well covered there. Yeah, definitely. I think like um, they said Dizel there, like, I, I spiel about it after and he sort of said it wasn't really a reflection on Dizel and he, he kind of felt quite bad for him, quite disappointed for him, but it was more just about changing the system and changing the way they were playing and going a bit more direct to Lyndon Dykes. And unfortunately, when you look at the team, Dizel was probably always going to be the one that had to make way for that if they were going to leave all the attacking um, players on the pitch. But yeah, I think Dizel's, um looks a lot better this season. I think we kind of spoke about it before, but he looks a bit... Um, I don't know. I kind of put it on Twitter that it went during the game, but he looks a bit almost like nastier, like in a good way. Like he look, he's sort of getting into people a lot more, and he's running about a lot more than he than he did last season. So I think he maybe the competition's been a good thing for him. You know, with all the new central midfield players coming in, that might have done him some good. And I think he's looked good. But yeah, saying that, I don't. I think like Field and Johansson will will play, might like you know be kind of, kind of the first choice, and then it's like I said that kind of third option um you know it's good to have all this competition i think because like you say irabunum hopefully i've got that right i think replicate ian's pronunciation very well done there but um he's obviously not he they took quite a while to get him in didn't they didn't happen until the last day of the transfer window so he's not gonna have come from aston villa to sit on the bench he's gonna want to play a lot of games as well so yeah there's plenty of competition kev do you think there's a a best three that you'd like to see or is it a case of just different challenges and um you know picking different players for, for different tasks well i haven't seen much of um tim and richards that right richards yeah so yeah. i can't comment on that so we we don't know but no not i think amos comes in it just gives you a little bit diff, a little bit different with his uh, running so uh, you know sort of i'm talking about closing down and energy the Dell's done all right. He has done better than last season. Basically, he's just running about a little bit more. That's mm. a, you can see a pass. He's got good technique in his left foot, but he's just got to be, you know, in that midfield area. You got to close down. This is part of the job. You, you, if you can't close down and run about in midfield, you ain't playing. Simple as that. So he's, he's done better in that um, aspect. And the two new lads haven't seen enough of them, so I can't really comment. But we would like, you know, we got three games in a week, and then. There's quite a lot of games, and then we finish in November. Mm. Up, yeah. Break. So there's a lot of games going to come thick and fast in the next whatever till November, and then when the season starts up again, do we start up again on Boxing Day? Is that right? Or was it before that? No, no it's September the tenth. It is against oh, the 10th. Burnley, I think. We have a month off in the season, yeah. which has never happened before. So there's going to be more crammed in games. We've got the FA Cup. As well, you never know. There might be replays. You might, you might get a run in it, <laughs> out it, but you never know. And uh, look, need a big squad, uh, mm. and we've got a good squad. I think we've got quite a big squad. We've got a lot of covering some places, so we need those players, and those players will have take will have some part to play in the season going forward. Yeah, and like we say, I mean, injuries always come into it. Luke Amos looks really good against Middlesbrough and then gets injured and doesn't play for a while. So, you know, there's always that that they've got to deal with as well. I'm excited to see um, Taylor Richards play, actually, because I think, Ian, you said that you... I think, did you had you seen him play this season? From the little time that he has played? played. About nine minutes at Blackburn. OK, so that nine minutes was quite encouraging, though, I remember you saying. so. Yeah, well, again, it's such a small sample size. I can't... Yeah. I'm not going to say I'm an expert and... Is he good? Well, sure, but he looked. He, he he reminds me a little bit of the style of um, Jaria at, at Reading. Okay, yeah. Um, but again, that was nine minutes of him at Ewood Park, and I haven't seen him play since. But um, from what I've heard about him and speaking to people that have seen him um, at Brighton, then you know he's he's, t he's talented, and I think the key thing is he can he can run with the ball, so he can bring the ball from midfield and sort of run. And when you're under pressure. You know, like like Saturday when they're, they're bombarding the box and you just want to get it clear, someone that can just pick the ball up and just bring it out and run forward and just ease pressure that way instead of... Um, so, yeah, he, he gives another option in the midfield area. So, as I say, they're, they're very well covered there. Got, yeah, I'd like to see him given an opportunity and I'm sure he will be um, when he gets fit and available. I'm sure um, Bill will want to see uh, what he's got, because especially because there's that option to bring him in 
um, permanently, right? You know, so I'm sure they'll want to get a good look at him before they obviously make a decision on that. But um, we'll move on to attackers then, which is Kev, I've Kev, your area of um, expertise. Obviously, he went with um, Tyler Roberts again on Saturday up front. Um, I thought he did okay. I thought he's obviously a very different player to Lyndon Dykes and you can't really compare them because they've got very different games. But he seemed a lot more comfortable dropping in, getting possession. and He's not... I play- He's not a number nine, as in... No, he's not really, is he? What that saying is a false nine, because I, I yeah. watched against Millwall, and yeah, you're right, he wants to come... Deep. He's like, he's basically a number... He's sort of a number 10 playing up front. Kind of like a Willock or a chair, isn't he? That yeah, pretty much that type. Player. He's a little bit you know, bigger and stronger, maybe a bit more, you know, back to goal, get hold of it. Not saying that, but Willock's very good at getting his body in between the ball and the man and wriggling, and, and wriggling away from them. Uh, but a little clip in my head just reminds me of what Roberts did on against Millwall. He was out in the second half. He was out in the left wing uh, area. He laid it to the sort of the left side. Of, I don't know if it was Chair or Powell. And he stood out there. Now, centre forward, lays it, and ru- runs straight in the box. So that suggests to me he's not a natural number nine. But that's not to say that that system with him playing does not work because it did against Millwall. And then you've got Lyndon Dykes, who is, a, we would say, a traditional number nine. And Macaulay Bond, who has sort of come out of come out of the blue and back in the squad and gets on the mm. pitch against Millwall. He's more, uh, you know, little, uh, a runner in behind, a little but strong, powerful runner in behind and wants to get in the box and score goals. So there's a, quite a good little mix there. And then you've got um, Armstrong, who... You know, raw, big, strong will run the channels and and and, and is effective uh, as a good sub and makes a big Im- impact and gets the crowd going. So they've got quite a, not a bad little blend of different uh, types of centre forwards there. Yeah, definitely. I think like um, it's interesting with Roberts because I think like we all said we were quite keen to see him giving a go up top and we've kind of seen that in a couple of games now. I wouldn't rule it out as something that continues, but I mean just to move back to Saturday and I thought when um when Dykes come on. I mean, he changed the game, really, didn't he, in a, in a positive way. And something they lack when Dykes doesn't play, obviously, we've, we've spoken about his struggles in front of goal and we all know about that. But he does give you a focal point and he does give mm. you something to aim at. And they kind of lacked that when Roberts was on the pitch, I thought. Not that Roberts mm. played necessarily badly. He was fine when he got on the ball, but he did, I don't know. He just isn't, doesn't have that sort of presence up top. Maybe he'll grow into it as the season goes on as if he plays up top more. But um, do you think that Dykes is, even though he's... Is it, is, is that debate we were having the other week? Is the co- sort of poor finishing worth putting him in for what he brings mm. to the team overall and the benefit he has to people like Chair and Willock? Do you think? I think it comes down to again the horses for courses, isn't it? I mean, he didn't start him at Millwall, and the reasoning for that was, I mean, if you look at the again, look back at I know it's last season, different players, different manager, etc. But up at Millwall, he was you know completely ineffective. He'd be marked by you know three giant centre backs. Mm. And he made a point, Beale, of saying at, after the Millwall game that he didn't go with Dykes because he felt with Roberts up front and Chair and Willett behind, they could play off them. And ultimately, almost not get into a fist fight with the centre backs, and, and it worked. Because, um, you know, although Dykes is a, he is a focal point up front, I don't think he's particularly good in the air. I think he will challenge and he'll win you on flicker on that, but he, you know, he's not. You know, he, he ordinary, norm, normally it seems that he, you know, he he will get beaten in the air by the centre back. So, um, but he do, he does play a role. I thought when he came on, he was good. You know, he because of his size and that, he does occupy a centre back, gives him something to think about. Um, but I think with what Roberts does give you, if you do get an injury to Chair or Willock or they're away and come back from international duty fatigued, he can probably play that role as well. He gives you the option of the 10. You saw last season how the team sort of fell apart without Willock last year. Now, I'm not saying that mm. Robert's in the same class as Willock yet or ever will be, but he is certainly someone that can can do that role. I mean, he is a, a talented player. For me, I think at times he looks a little bit casual. I thought, you know, little flicks and that, just, mate, just put your foot through the ball. Just lay a pass off, five-yard pass. You haven't got to make it beautiful and pretty. Just be effective but I thought what he brings to the team was shown in the build-up for that that first goal at Millwall where he sort of occupied that left side and rolls it inside the chair he then rolls it into the path of Willock who scores that's you know what he brings 
but um you know but it goes back again we put we need to get a number a number nine in but what's an the old style number nine the big the big target man duncan ferguson type there's not many around are they and you know dykes isn't scoring goals but in the way the terms of the team sets up and the role he plays he, he you know he's reasonably effective he just you know if he had sort of three goals to his name this season then you know it would perhaps his role in the team would look a bit more uh secure than it does at the moment definitely and that's ultimately what it comes down to i think he would be starting every game had he just got those sitters but unfortunately he didn't which is why we're having this kind of debate but um yeah, like Ian said there, Kev, there is options, isn't there? Obviously, Macaulay Bonner has been named on the bench the last couple of games and looks like he sort of worked his way back, not necessarily into the team, but he's sort of back in the fold at least. Um, Sinclair Armstrong scored a hat-trick for the under-21s on Friday, wasn't involved um, in the game on, on Saturday. But, you know, they got him as well. Who's, and got, we've got something going out on him. Um, it might even be out by the time the podcast is out or certainly soon after of Mick Beal t- sort of talking about that he's a first-team player. Um, that he just kind of wanted to get him some game time, I think, and wanted him to um, to get a goal to his name because obviously he'd been used a lot off the bench this season. I don't know for the comp- for the confidence or you know for the legs as well, just to get him a bit more game time, which is sort of understandable. But um, I mean, you were kind of um, talking about maybe like a loan move, perhaps being better for Armstrong at this stage of his career. Is that something they should look at in January? Do you think? Uh, it depends if they bring someone in. Um, mm. But like like him playing in the twenty ones, that's good. You can't. Um, you need to at that age you need to be playing football and regular football and it's great for him he probably wants to be involved in the first team and and stuff and same would i be but you know 10 minutes here 15 minutes there it's good it's brilliant but you need you need your 90 minutes for fitness wise and also like like you just mentioned he scored the three goals there his confidence will be sky it will be sky high you know, scoring a hat trick in the under twenty one. So, I think um, it. You know, if you're playing a Saturday, if the match is on a Saturday, and then the under twenty threes are playing on the on the Tuesday, that, that, that's sort of perfect for Sinclair Armstrong, where he can, you know, maybe be on the bench on the first team on a Saturday, and then and get his minutes in during midweek, and then the following Saturday he's on the bench and make it on for 10, 15 minutes. So, that's um, if he if look people we. People, scouts all over the country from League One, League Two and and the National League will know that Sinclair Armstrong has scored a hat-trick for the under-21s and they'll be monitoring him and they'll probably be ringing up and saying, look, you know, bear us in mind uh, in the January transfer window for Sinclair Armstrong, we'd like to take him on loan. And then he's, then the club have got to make the decision and, and Armstrong's got to make the decision. Do I stay and get 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there? Or do I get a run of games in a football league and, and gain some really good experience for himself yeah. and his progression and his career? <clears throat> yeah, I, I I agree with that. I think as well what's important, it's got to be the right loan. I think some of the loans I had last season with some young players were the wrong loans. Um, you know, Charlie Kelman's doing really well at Leighton Orient at the moment. He's playing under Richie Wellens, who plays a style of football which is quite progressive in League Two. Um Charlie Kelvin playing on, you know, up front for what's his name? Steve um Evans. Steve Evans. Evans. You know, that ranting and raving style of manager and a you know a long ball football. It's no good to him really. And he regressed last year, probably because of a bad loan. You can say maybe a Faisal Batash as well. Went to Oldham, hasn't really kicked on. And you know, is he his future looks doesn't look great at, at QPR at the moment. Um so they've got to bear that in mind. And I think that's what Bill was saying you know we want to keep him here so we can see him in training so we can monitor him so we know what what work he's getting what he's doing what he can be better at and then maybe in january they'll look at it and they'll sort of go well where where's best for him to go you know league one maybe i mean sinclair answer if i was a striker and a qpr as a young lad i'm looking for a loan i'm looking to go to a club that you know i'll be doing my homework i want to go to a club mm-hmm. that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, if you're playing chances and you're scoring, you look good. Don't go to a bottom of the table team who, like you just said, who just bang it forward and nothing, and it's like rigid defending and just hanging on in there. That's and you come back after a loan of three or four months and you've got like one goal to to your name, and then everyone's giving it. Well, we went here and it didn't work out for him. Why are we going to take the risk on him? So, Ian, hundred percent right. It's got to be the right loan for the player and the club. 
Mm. Selfishly, I quite hope he stays because I like seeing him when he comes on, just run about like a madman and bully some people who are like 10 years older than <laughs> it's great to watch so hopefully he stays but yeah I mean it might be that alone if they bring another striker it might be better for his, for his career but um Ian just finally on um on the strikers Macaulay Bond is he someone that sort of deserves a bit more of an opportunity to kind of show what he can do because he's not I know he's kind of come back into the the fold a little bit recently but he's not not really had it obviously we spoke last week about um you know he was gonna gonna leave wasn't he on, on deadline day and it didn't quite um come through but is he someone that you know Maybe he might get his opportunity, obviously, if injuries kind of um, go his way. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, he gives another option off the bench, doesn't he? Um, you know, he's obviously, Mick, Mick Beale said he's got a decent relationship with him and that's sort of been borne out with the fact that he's put him back in the squad. And um, But, I mean, he's just got to be professional, hasn't he? If he, or he obviously wants to leave, but if he wants to leave, you've got to put, almost put yourself in the shop window. You know, and knuckle down and say, OK, well, I'm here now. And when I come on, I'm going to take my chance. Um, I don't think he's helped himself, to be honest. Some of his comments in the past about wanting to go when he's at Ipswich. And, you know, it, it's all right to give one interview where you kind of raise eyebrows, but do it twice. You, you know, it doesn't put you in a good in a good place with the kind of, you know, the powers of B at the club, um, it appears. But, you know, the manager's got him. If he, you know, he's, t- he's still getting paid. If he's there, he's an experienced striker at sort of football league level. You might as well have him and use him. And you know, yeah, well, you throw him on, he might get a goal for you. You know, but he's got to prove that if he wants to start, that he can, you know, bring a role to the team. But um, I think if you're looking at it, it's Sinclair. He looks great when he comes on, crash bang wallop. But he's 19, Macaulay Bond's 26. So if you're looking at it from a manager's point of view, you kind of go, well, I've got experienced head here and I've got a young lad who is still learning his trade I think you know most managers are going to lean with the experienced player who it seems like it's um maybe one of when everyone's fit it's one of those two to make the squad at the moment it's mm. you know Robert Stikes um and then Bono Armstrong on the bench because he's kind of got to cover the other positions so it seems like they're kind of in a bit of competition for each other with um for, for sort of a place in the squad yeah, he's very big on training as well, Bill. He's very how you perform in training dictates a lot whether or not you're going to be in the squad. And I mean that you know the players that aren't involved in the squad maybe they're not doing it in training. Um, mm. Maybe Bon is turning on in training and looking good, and you know Sinclair needs to needs to blow in the in the reserve. I don't know. You, you can't really say, but um, you know he he he's a first and foremost he's a coach, isn't he, Bill? He's a coach who's now a manager. So he works with him on the training pitch and that's more in vogue in the game now, you know, in Kev's era, I'm guessing that you, the managers you played under didn't really spend a lot of time on the training pitch. They would just sort of observe rather than actually take, take training yeah. with Walton lot. did it, Bill did it. And, you know, these modern, the new young coaches that are in are very much, much more hands-on than, than perhaps managers were in the past. Yeah, no, I think you're probably right. Um, I mean, I think we can kind of all agree that he, um, you know, the the main thing is getting the best out of Willick and Chair, really, isn't it? We talk about obviously strikers and stuff, but I mean, the the level those two are playing at, at the moment, Kev, it's, you know, they they're a match for anyone, aren't they, in the championship when those two are on it? And sort of Chair started a bit quietly, but certainly has been back to his um or near his best certainly lately. And obviously Willock with all the goals. I mean, yeah, I don't think he had his best game on um on Saturday, but. He, he just, whenever he gets the ball on the edge of the box in that position and he's given a bit of space, you back him to score. And that's such a big quality to have in the team, isn't it? So I think it's important no. to, to note those two. I mean, they're, they're the focus, aren't they, really, in the attacking areas? And they should be. Yeah, 100%, because they've scored the most goals. And was Willock scored five, chair four, am I right? Yeah, I think so, Which, yeah. Chair got really, four, maybe. really good going. Uh, chair might have it, but yeah, I don't know how many chairs got, but Willick's got five or six, hasn't it? I think. Yeah, so really good going for the number tens, really. Attacking midfielders or second strikers, whatever you want to call them. But I think you take Willock out and Chair doesn't seem to perform as well mm. as when he's with Willock because they sort of they were in tandem that I've said it before, that left sort of channel side. They're like always drifting because they're right footed and they want to both want to come in and you know, curl into the far corner, which they've done, and take shots from that inside left um, area of the pitch. And that's where they got their most joy scoring goals. But, yeah, it's, I mean, if, if you're the manager, you've got to get your arm around them every day and keep them happy. And, you know, 
just big them up. I've, I've seen before with players. Jerry Francis used to do that when I was a kid in the in um, in the youth team, and he'd have his arm around Les Ferdinand all the time, you know, because he knew Les was scoring the goals, and and that and that's the difference between three points and. But no. you had a lot of arms around you in your career, didn't you, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> so do you know what I mean? So I'm not sure I have a football club, professional clubs, you see the best player and managers just arm round and keeping them happy. That's what you gotta do. That's what managers do. Because they know they're the you're, you're the match winners. You get it solid at the back, which they have been the last two games, and you've got you know a bit of quality in midfield and legs and running about, and then you've got two potential match winners in your team who are on form at the moment. So, well, you certainly bigged them up after um after Saturday as well. He said 15 goals and 15 assists. That's the aim for both of them. So no no pressure on them. 15 goals and 15 assists. No shorter, but uh, well, rate, he, he, he backs them. He rates them very highly, and, and he's backing them, and he's 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 trying to get them to get to that you know uh, level at the end of the season. So you know if they carry on the way they are, they've got a good chance of doing that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. the great. I mean, they're they're a joy to watch when they're on song. They really are, mm. and. BLS said that one of the reasons he took the job was a chance to work with those two. And uh, I'm, I'm not privy to, you know, the terms of him, his appointment, but I would imagine there's a good drop chance he would have said, you've got to tell me these two aren't being sold. If they're going to be sold, then I'm not going to take the job. Um, so maybe that's a factor in, you know, they have managed to keep them. And they've done well to keep them. Um, but I mean, there's nowhere else, there's nowhere else in the, in the championship that has two tens like these two. It's very unique. There's no one else that plays like that. Um, mm. it's very hard to handle for teams that, you know, you see it more in the Premier League. Uh, I mean, Liverpool did it with Mane and Salah for so long, the two sort of, um, you know, attacking midfielders for want of a, a, a better like Wide forwards, aren't they? Almost. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, it will look so good. He's, um, I don't know, is he... It's hard to say, isn't it? Can he do it in the Premier League? I don't know. I think given the right role and if he was like yeah. able to play more centrally and get on the ball, I think he could. But I mentioned it before, the thing I'd worry about is if he goes to a team and they just stick him out wide on the wing and he doesn't get much mm. opportunity to get on the ball. Yeah. Because we see it happen quite a lot. That's what I'd worry about. But I think he needs to play in the right position. And at QPR, he's got everything. It's kind of built around him, isn't it? He's, you know, I, get I, know the ball talk about, I don't think he's better than Eze. I think Eze was a, is a, almost a generation of what he can do. He just, I don't think he's anyone else in the English game, in the English game that plays sort of in a manner that Eze does. He's, he's, you know, he's so good. Um, and Willock's, you know, you can't say he's far behind him though, what he, he did at QPR. I mean, it, it's going to be hard to keep him if he carries on like he is now. It, it, it really will. Um, but I mean, them two in the side, they're, they're your key really. If you're going to finish in the top six, push for promotion, you know, Chair and Willock are, 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 you know, without doubt, the, the main men in the team. And, you know, if you keep the two fullbacks fit, you know, because they're, you know, Laird's growing, you know, more influential by the week. And, you know, and Kenneth Powell's turned up now, hasn't he? You know, he looks, you know, from that first four games, we thought, oh, is this bloke any good? He, he really... That was you, know, you, I think, mate. Well, I think you can take. I think it was fair though. He didn't. He yeah, didn't no, I agree. I, he wasn't for a few weeks. So. No, he was a bit quiet, wasn't he? He's a bit un um, under the radar. I mean, his, and... his ability in the air, his ability to judge flight is astonishing for a little guy. He's just, you know, I've seen it a couple of games now where teams are away from home, particularly trying to target him over his head. You know, diagonal balls in in in, in behind the fullback, and he hasn't been fooled at all. He's, he's really really impressive. Yeah, I mean, just a note to end on it. I think with on like Willock, um, I think that like Beal said um, previously, like he's got as much talent as anyone he's kind of worked with. I think he's obviously more talking about the young players that he's worked with. Um, and I, I actually was, um, was at Brentford's training ground on Friday, and I was speaking to um Josh De Silva, and he played with Willock at Arsenal when they were younger. And I was just, I just mentioned sort of mentioned to him, oh, do you know um do you know Chris Willock? And he was like, yeah, yeah, um. You know, and he's like, I think he he just said, I think he's got um out of everyone I've played with, I think he he's like had the most ability, natural ability as that like anyone he's played with, which is like a big statement to make. But it just kind of shows like it's a bit weird that he went under the radar for a little while. Obviously, I know he went away to Benfica, so naturally like the focus in this country isn't on him as much. But he's obviously really highly rated at Arsenal, and then it kind of fell off a bit, and he's kind of come back to QPR, and now he's flourishing. But it took him a little while, so it's quite. You know, strange, but obviously I don't know what quite went wrong and well, not wrong, but what kind of happened to him in those sort of couple of years. But um certainly he's flourishing now and it seems like everyone you speak to is kind of 
played with him or had experience with him has sort of rates him incredibly highly. And I think QPR of I mean, what a bit of, what a bit of business that was to get him in. Was it seven hundred and fifty thousand that they spent on him? I think around that. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic bit of business. And yeah, I mean, you'd have to back back him to go to the Premier League at some point, hopefully with with QPR. But um, let's see how the rest of the season goes. But yeah. Thanks for um. Sorry, go on in. We're gonna. I was gonna say it's just interesting what you were saying about if he was to go to a, a team, how he's used because he did have a stint on loan at West Brom and didn't kick under Allardyce and didn't play, didn't kick a ball. Yeah, there on like a season long loan or half season loan, didn't play. Um, did okay at Huddersfield, but you know he's really when he first came to yeah. QPR, he wasn't um like anywhere near what he is now. Mm. He he looked quite good with, but then it was only really at the back end of that season when he came, wasn't it, that he really. Um, sort of came into his own and then it was like into the next season where it was like and now kind of coming on to what he is now but I think yeah it sort of took him a bit of a while to shake that off maybe and but yeah the three fair play to QPR obviously they've done their done their own work and they backed him um, and he's absolutely delivered so yeah hopefully he goes from strength to strength but yeah um, do let us know what you think um, in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube and leave us a like and subscribe to the channel and if you're listening to us on whatever streaming platform where you get your podcasts um do make sure to follow our feed and leave us a positive review if you enjoyed uh listening to us which hopefully you did and we'll be back with another episode very soon